So welcome to the first topic in IB Chemistry, topic 11, measurement and data processing. And we're going to look at it in two parts, uh, uncertainties and errors in measurements and results, and graphical techniques. So these are the objectives that you will need to have learnt by the end of this first part on uncertainties and errors in measurements, section 11.1. I won't go through them in detail. You can pause the video and look at them yourselves. But you have to have, by the end of the unit, a clear understanding that you should understand all of those points and also be able to do the second half of those points. So let's look at errors and uncertainties. So we've got to look at some key terms. So the first key term we will look at is the idea of the two different types of errors. So there are two types of errors, random error, which is above or below a true value, and usually due to the limitations of equipment, and systematic error, which is in one direction and usually due to an instrument or something wrong in your method. Also commonly uh, misused in English language are the concepts of precision and accuracy. They have very definite terms in science and chemistry and physics in particular, where precision is a measure of certainty, and it's a plus or minus value, and accuracy, which is how close to the value uh, you have got through your experiment is to an accepted value. So just giving a visual representation of that, um, in terms of, say, throwing uh, darts at a dartboard, uh, the first animation on your right shows low accuracy, high precision, which means that your random error is small. Um, they're very closely clumped together, those um, darts, but your systematic error is large because you are nowhere near the value you expected. Ideally, uh, we want to move across slowly towards the, the, the right values or right animation. So looking at the second cartoon, uh, we have high accuracy, low precision, which means that your random error is large um, so you're getting around the value with some range, um, but your systematic error is small. And finally, the ideal, where we have high accuracy and high precision, where the random error is small, okay, the values are very close together, and your systematic error is also very small because you're very close to the expected value. Okay, so let's look at some now causes of systematic error, because these are errors that we can reduce when we're doing experiments. We kind of have no control over random errors. So an example could be the physical errors in the measuring device. For example, here is a thermometer in this image, and if it's dropped uh, and it has small air bubbles in it, and it leaks, um, say, from a gas syringe, then those bubbles are obviously going to affect what we're reading from the thermometer. Uh, important for your experimental work over the year, uh, improper and sloppy use of a measuring device. For example, a uh, measuring cylinder, which we see here on the right. So uh, you measure, for example, uh, the values of temperature in Fahrenheit instead of Celsius. Um, so units are important. You didn't select the right size or range for an instrument, or the instrument wasn't calibrated correctly or cleaned, something called Parallax error, um, which is seen in this image on the right here. So he's looking straight on, or she. So that means that you're reading the value straight ahead, so there's no parallax error. But if you're reading it, say, from above or below, then you're going to have uh, an inaccurate view of where the actual liquid level is. So it's important to be parallel with the uh, meniscus when you're reading it. And we've also got ambient conditions, uh, the temperature, the pressure, and air currents can change during the experiment. So you need to be able to monitor in those and control them. Because, for example, with temperature, you can have your solvents evaporating, which can affect your experimental results because your volumes decrease. Okay, so how do we reduce random uncertainty? So the way we reduce random uncertainty is to repeat the experiment. So, for example, repeating it at least three times. Okay, because they're random. So hopefully the more times you do the experiment, these random errors kind of cancel each other out. That's the idea behind it. Uh, ideally, a range of five um, should be expected in order to determine a relationship, which we'll look more at when we're looking at 
experiments. Okay, so how do you determine experiments or oh, uncertainty? Okay, unless the instrument tells you, uncertainty is measured in one of two ways. Okay, so the first way is for glassware and similar instruments. The uncertainty is half the smallest increment of the instrument. And for digital instruments, the uncertainty is the smallest number, the smallest digit. So just looking at this example here, so looking at this measuring cylinder, if you look up close here, where we have it here, no parallax error, the meniscus, you can see the volume is between 17 centimetres cubed and 18 centimetres cubed. Therefore, the uncertainty is half the smallest digit. So it's going to be um, basically half or 0.5, because the smallest digit is 1. So the answer for that volume in terms of uncertainty is 17.5 plus or minus 0.5 centimetres cubed, because 1 is the smallest digit. Okay, so looking out at a ruler, can you work out the uncertainty here? So just pause the video now, and let's see if you get close. Okay, so welcome back. So we can see the markings on the ruler are between 1.6 and 1.7 centimetres. Okay, so the uncertainty is half the smallest digit, which is going to be 0.1, divide that by 2, 0.05. So we record the value in terms of its uncertainty as 1.65 plus or minus 0.05 centimetres as our measurement. Okay, so here's another example to work out. So, thinking about uncertainty, what is the length of the wooden stick? Um, so pause the video now, try and work it out, and then unpause, and let's see if you're getting close to the right answer. Okay, so you should have got either 4.5 centimeters plus or minus 0.5, 0.5 centimetres, 4.54 centimetres plus or minus 0.95 centimetres, or 4.547 centimetres plus or minus 0.02 centimetres. Remembering it's half the smallest digit, so the answer has to be 4.5 plus or minus 0.05 centimetres. Okay. Second example, what is the mass on the scale? Those are your three options, so pause the video now and let's see if you can get the right answer. Okay, so coming back, it's going to be 0.025 plus or minus 0.01 grams. Okay, because the smallest value is going to be 0.001 divided by 2. Um, so those are just two examples of um, how you now write uncertainties. Okay, so uncertainty can also be using something called the halfway method. So if there is one factor with significant uncertainty that will override all the other uncertainties, use something called the halfway method. So you take the lowest value of an experiment from the highest value, divide it by two, and that's your uncertainty. So for example, uh, things like stopwatches uh, use something called the halfway method. Okay, so this estimates our reaction times for about 0.1 seconds. Okay, so what is the uncertainty for the following data? Okay, so you've got all those numbers there. So using the halfway method, can you work out the uncertainty for this data? Okay, so hopefully you've paused the video, worked it out, done some calculations. So the answer is going to be um, roughly, using the halfway measure, the average is 9. Uh, the error is going to be 12 minus 6, because 12 is the biggest number, and 6 is the smallest number. You're going to divide that by 2, 
which will give you 3. Therefore, the uncertainty for this data is going to be 9 plus or minus 3. Quite a bit of error. Okay, so it's important that you calculate the average and then work out the uh, half value from the highest and the smallest. Okay, so it's important also for significant figures and the ideas of significant zeros. This will also be important for those taking physics. So rule one, zeros in the middle of a number are significant. So 94.072, the zero is significant. Rule two, zeros at the beginning of a number are not significant. So those 0, 0.0 in green there are not significant numbers, where 834 are significant. Zeros at the end of a number and after a decimal point are significant. For example, 1.38.2, uh, 0, 0, those two zeros are significant. So after the decimal point. And finally, rule four, zeros at the end of a number and before our implied decimal point may or may not be significant. Okay, so there's a bit of um, leeway there. Okay, so let's practice some significant zeros. So what I want you to do for this exercise here is work out whether the zeros count or don't count. What's the rule that we'll be using? Okay, so pause now. And then once you think you've got them all, press play and we'll see if you're correct. Okay, so let's just look at this. So for 45.8736, there's no significant zero, so all digits count. For the next one, 0 0.00239, the first three zeros don't count, okay, because they're leading. For the next one, um, 0 0.0023900, 0 .00 the leading ones don't count, but the trailing ones do. For the next one, the zeros count in decimal form. Uh, 48,000 zeros don't count because there's no decimal. Okay, you've got to be very careful with that. Uh, all digits count for that one and for the last one the zeros between the digits count as well as that final zero at the end. Okay, so hopefully you got all marks for that. Right, so the rules for significant figures. Multiplication and division. Okay, so rule one. In carrying out a multiplication or a division the answer cannot have more significant figures than either of the original numbers. So here we have um, the numerator being three significant figures, the denominator being four significant figures, so therefore the um, answer will be in at least three significant figures. Can't be more than that, can't be four, it's going to be three, two or one. It cannot have more significant figures than either of the original numbers. Okay, rule two, for addition of subtraction, your answer should only have the same number of unit placings as the most imprecise number. Okay, so here's the example here. 0 0.011 plus 0 0.01 equals 0 0.021, but our value can only be uh, precise to 0 0.02 because 0 0.01 is the most imprecise of those two numbers to start off with. Okay. And the same for 90,000 plus 900. Uh, 90,000 is the most inaccurate, so it means that, or imprecise, so it means that 90,000 can be the uh, most significant figure that you use. Okay. Okay, so now what I want you to do is to practice uh, the multiplication and division of uh, with significant figures. So what I want you to do is basically give me the answers and the correct significant figures. Okay, so pause the video now and try and work out whether 3 point, 3, when 32.27 is multiplied by 1.54, what is the correct answer to the correct significant figures? And continue on for the rest of those uh, questions. And then unpause the video and see if you got it correct. Okay, so let's look at the first one. Obviously, 1.54 is in three significant figures. 
So it must mean that it's most imprecise, so the answer has to be in three significant figures. Okay. Uh, the next one, 3.68 is the most imprecise of those numbers, so that means 46.4353312 has to be shown in three significant figures, rounded to 46.4. Okay. Um, the next one, 1 1.750 times 0 0.34200, 0 0.05985, 1.750 is um, in four significant figures, so it must be given to four significant figures. So it's 0 0.05985. Remember, of course, that zero is not significant. Okay. So it's the beginning of the number. And the next one, 3.2650 times 10 to the 6 times 4.858. So it's going to be, of course, in four significant figures because 4.858 is the most imprecise of those numbers to give us the answer. And finally, 1.000 because, again, four significant figures. Okay, in the imprecise number. Hope we got those all correct. So what about addition and subtraction of significant figures? Okay, so let's look at 25.5 plus 34.270. Okay, how did we get 59.770? Okay, because 25.5 is the most imprecise, three significant figures, then you must round the product of round the um, sum, sorry, to 59.8. Okay, so here's another example, 32.72 minus 0.049 gives 32.7151. So now I want you to pause the video now and try and work out what the uh, answer is in terms of significant figures. Okay, so 32.72 minus 0.049, so four significant figures. Okay, so it's going to be back into four significant figures, moving the arrow down again, so 32.72. And the final one, 320 plus 12.5 gives 332, so 320. So it's going to be three significant figures. So 332.5 to three significant figures is going to be 330. Okay. So let's have some practice with the addition and subtraction of significant figures. The important things to look for are that unit placing is important and the most imprecise number um, will determine the level of precision that you give in your product. Okay, so pause the video now, now you know the routine, and then replay once you think you have all the answers. Okay, so let's look at the first one, so 0 0.56 plus 1.153 giving 0.713. So 0.56 is the most imprecise number, so it must be 0 0.71. 82,000 plus 5.32, giving 82,005.32. So the most imprecise number is 5.32 with three significant figures, so that means the answer has to be in three significant figures, which is 82,000. Remember those zeros. And the 10. 0 0.0 minus 9.8742 giving 0 0.12580. So the most imprecise number there is going to be uh, remembering zeros, uh, one significant figure in 10. So it's going to be 0 0.1. And finally, 10 minus 9.7887 uh, is going to be 0 0.1. 580, but the number of significant figures can only be uh, one significant figure, so 0.12 rounded to one significant figure is going to be zero. Ah, bit of a fun number that. Okay, so key terms now are absolute uncertainty. Now looking at, so we've looked at errors, now let's look at uncertainty. So the key terms are um, 
absolute uncertainty, which is the plus minus value in a reading. Uh, the percentage uncertainty, the plus minus value in a reading divided by the reading. And absolute and percentage error, which absolute being a measured value less than accepted value. And the percentage error being the measured value less accepted value all divided by the accepted value. Okay, so you've, got, you've been given a value that's accepted, and we're going to compare your experimental result with the accepted value. Okay, so propagation of uncertainty. Okay, so propagation means basically the more times you do something, the more chance you're going to have an, of error, especially that systematic error. It's going to build up. There's going to be more uncertainty. Okay, so for addition and subtraction, you add uncertainties together. And for division and multiplication, you add the percentage uncertainties together. And the final uncertainty is a single significant figure, and the final answer is rounded off to a similar number of places as the final uncertainty. Okay, so the more values you have, the more uncertain you are of it. When it comes to adding them together, and you only use whole values for addition and subtraction and percentages for division and multiplication. Okay, so here's an example. Table 1, the raw data of uh, to, to determine the density of water. So we have these values here, okay? Three trials and average. We have the un uncertainties in each of the uh, variables, volume, mass and, uh, of the beaker and mass of the beaker plus water, okay? So the mass of the water will equal the mass of the beaker minus of, of plus water minus the mass of the beaker. So it's 30.04 plus 0 0.1 minus 20.01 plus 0 0.1. Okay, so you're adding those 0.1s together. So it's going to be 30.4 minus 20.01 plus or minus 0 0.1 plus 0 0.01. So it's going to be 10.03 plus or minus 0.11. Density of water gets a little more complicated uh, because you're dividing. Okay, so it's going to be now the percentage errors. Uh, you're going to convert your absolute values uh, of uncertainty into percentage values of uncertainty. Okay, using the following calculations outlined. So you end up with 0.0833 plus or minus 5.9887%. Okay. And you end up with a final value of 0.98 plus or minus 0.06 grams per centimetres cubed. Okay, it's a little bit more complicated because you do have to work out the percentage error. Okay, so that's important. Okay, so basically the percentage error is used to determine how accurate you have been in your final value arrived at your experiment. Uh, very similar to the percentage uncertainty. It takes your answer and compares it to a true value. Okay, so the percentage error essentially is your accepted value minus what you've got from your experiment divided by the accepted value times 100. Okay, and the calculation, for example, here we have an experiment that you found the density of the solution to be 1.017 grams per centimeters cubed. True value is 1.011 grams per centimeters cubed. What's the percentage error? Well, the percentage error is going to be the accepted minus the measured divided by the accepted times 100. So you plug the numbers in and you get an error of 0.6%. Reasonably acceptable uh, percentage error. Okay, so the final section in terms of uncertainty and error measuring with glassware. Okay, so during the year, and I'm sure you use it in IGCSE as well, you use titrations. Um, in terms of using glassware, you've rinsed uh, your pipette with a solution, you've filled your pipette with a solution, you've adjusted the level, uh, avoiding the parallax error through a calibration line, you've drained it, and a drop remains in the tip. Okay, that's how you use a uh, pipette. For a burette, you rinse the solution out because you don't want anything that was in there to be uh, affecting your concentration. You fill up. Again, you record your initial reading um, using uh, your eyes parallel because, again, you want to avoid that parallax error. Okay, and you record the value. And finally, 
using a volumetric flask, accurately weigh out a sample of a primary standard, you transfer that sample into volumetric flask, ensure the complete uh, transfer of that uh, solid through washing with water, you dissolve the primary standard with shaking, and you add a little bit of water to make up the solution to the mark, and then mix again, so therefore it's homogeneous through the entire volumetric standard solution. Okay, so the, the last part, just a few, few more slides, is about graphical techniques. Okay, again, these are the things that you should both understand and be able to do. I'm not going to go through them in detail. You can pause and basically tick off these things that you should know, and if you don't know them, then you need to go over your notes again, come and see me, discuss it with your colleagues or your classmates, so you have a full understanding of what is required. Okay, these are the things that you need to know for this section. Okay, so there's different types of graphs. You've got directly proportional graphs, okay, nice straight lines. Um, you've got the uh, other side with the air pressure perceived loudness. That's also directly proportional, but it's proportional to the square. And you've got inversely proportional, 1 over x, okay, which gives that wonderful graph there, or series of graphs there. This one here, of course, is the 1 over x over x graph, which should be, in theory, a straight line. Okay, so you can either calculate manually the slope um, through change in y over change in x, okay, and that's going to have associated errors. And in terms of your IB graph expectations, this is what is expected of you, okay. So you need to have an understanding of the experimental error when you're doing the graphs. Okay. So notice that time, for example, is plus or minus 0.01 seconds, and temperature is plus or minus 0.1 seconds. <clears throat> and also with uh, graphs, you are expected to have, therefore, error lines for your appropriate graphs, illustrating the amount of uncertainty you have in your value. Okay. In this particular case, the horizontal errors of temperature are just too small to be seen. But every value that you have for your experiment will have its associated error. And that is pretty much the end of this particular topic. So again, go over the, um, the learning objectives for the unit and make sure you are familiar with them and you understand them.